we open your word and we open up our hearts to what you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you may be seated. I enjoyed uh, what that time of worship taught us there and reminded us of, and that is God is so holy, he's so good, we don't deserve to stand in his presence but because of his grace and mercy, we get to call him father and friend. Isn't that amazing? Let's give the Lord a round of applause this morning. Hey, we'll be in Hebrews chapter 5 this morning. If you have your Bibles, be turning there. It's toward the back of your Bible. Hebrews chapter 5. If you don't have a Bible, let me encourage you to get one in the pew in front of you there. And if you're unfamiliar with where Hebrews is, it's page 1063 in the pew Bible. Hebrews chapter 5. We've been going through a series here at Beacon Hill called We Before Me, and we'll have this week and next week left in this series, and then we'll begin something new for a few weeks uh, leading up to Easter. But we've been talking about how collectively as a church that we can do much more for the kingdom of God than we can as individuals. And in fact, how God has chosen the church to move forward his mission of expanding his kingdom. Isn't it so humbling and so amazing? that we get to be a part of God's mission. I mean, think about it. God could have chosen any way that he wanted to accomplish his mission of seeing folks come to know him, seeing his, his kingdom expand, and he chose his church, you and me. He chose Beacon Hill Baptist Church to be part of that mission, and what a privilege and an honor that is. Well, we've looked at what that means to be a community on mission for the Lord, and we've talked about how we're to be a united community, we're to be a loving community, a praying community, we're to reach people and to serve, all of these things. Well, today I want to talk to you a little bit about how we are to be a maturing community, a maturing community. Uh, as my wife and I, my, our family, we moved back to Somerset. We've been away for about six years. Uh, it's been interesting coming back, and one of the main questions that I've been asked time and time again is, how are you adjusting being back in Somerset? How are you liking being back in Somerset? And I found it interesting because uh, for many years, I was a children's pastor here in town, and moving back into Somerset, I'm getting to see all of the children who were part of my children's ministry, and some of them are in their 20s now and, and married and having kids. And I commented the other day to someone how it's amazing how kids grow up, but we don't get any older, right? Uh, but, you know, it, that's been interesting to me to come back and notice how the kids have grown up and all of this stuff. But what would be even stranger is if I came back and they hadn't grown up. I mean, think about that. If I had been away for six years and moved back and everything was still exactly the same, everybody was still exactly the same, I mean, that's like something out of a movie, right? And so that would be strange because as people, we grow and mature. We get older and we develop physically, and now, you know, my hair's falling out and all this kind of stuff because I'm getting closer to 40 these days. And that's what happens, right? We grow and we mature and we develop. And children remind us so many times of things that we are to learn about God's kingdom, things we are to learn about the family of God. My kids remind me time and time again about growing and developing. I have five kids, and they're all at all different stages. We have one about 15 months and one who's getting ready to turn 11, and then all in between. So we have them like at all stages right now, and it's going to be interesting once we get to the teen years because we haven't experienced that fully uh, yet at our house. But all of those ages remind me how we are to grow and advance and develop, but not only uh, physically, but spiritually. And as we come to the Bible, we find that believers should, try, should strive to grow into spiritual mature, spiritually mature followers of Jesus. Let me say that again. Believers should strive to grow into spiritually mature followers of Jesus. And as we get to this letter to the Hebrews, we find that one of the main goals that this writer has in writing to these Hebrew Christians is to remind them about who Jesus is and what he did for them and why he is the Messiah. And in this particular pa uh, passage, after he's explained all of these things, he gets to the point where he just kind of says, hey, I'm kind of frustrated with you all because I'm reminding you of things that you already should have known and been well beyond in your spiritual maturity. 
and you can see some of his frustrations pouring out in what he's writing. And as we come to the Bible, one of the things I love about the Bible, let me just say, is that sometimes we read and we find encouragement. Sometimes we read and we find hope and things that bring us joy. And then other times we read and we find correction. We find rebuke. We find things that should convict us and show us that we are out of line. And let me tell you, it's, it's a lot easier to read the encouraging things. But we need both. We need some correcting sometimes. We need some encouraging sometimes. And this morning, we're going to look at a passage where uh, the writer was, was trying to rebuke in some ways and correct in other ways the Hebrews' thinking when it came to spiritual maturity. I want to begin in verse 11 of Hebrews 5. Just after the writer has spent some time explaining all of these uh, thoughts about Jesus that he's presented so far, and look at what he says. We have a great deal to say about this, and it's difficult to explain since you've become too lazy to understand. Although by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the basic principles of God's revelation again. You need milk, not solid food. Now, everyone who lives on milk is inexperienced with the message about righteousness because he's an infant. But solid food is for the mature, for those whose senses have been trained to distinguish between good and evil. Father, as we look to your word this morning, we pray that for every single one of us, we would see the importance of of growing and developing spiritually. Lord, for those of us who maybe need some nudging along in this, Lord, I pray that you would convict us today to see the importance of why we need you and why we need to be growing Christians. Lord, I thank you that we can grow and that you bring that within our lives. And in this time together this morning, I pray that you'll do just that. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as I mentioned, children oftentimes teach us about what it's like to be in the family of God. And there's an analogy here that's presented to the Hebrew Christians, and it's this, that when you're saved, it's like you're an infant in Christ. You're a baby in Christ because there's so much you don't know. There's so much that you can't do yet, and you've got to learn and you've got to grow. But as you grow in Christ, one of the things that he says is it's like moving from milk to solid food. You get to that point that you should grow to the point that you can have in-depth discussions about God, that you should be searching the scriptures for deeper things and finding things that, that maybe you hadn't thought about before and been be convicted about things you haven't been convicted about before. And as we think about that, every single one of us as believers should be on a path of spiritual maturity. We should be growing and developing and because that's what kids do. And as I thought about coming back to Somerset and seeing these kids that had grown up, it made me think about, just for a moment, imagine if someone had visited Beacon Hill maybe, let's say, six years ago, because I've been away six years. Let's just stick with that number. Six years ago. And they saw you where you were spiritually. And then they came back now six years later. Would they find people who had been more mature spiritually than when they were here last because that should be the norm the norm is that we're growing in Christ it should be weird and like something out of a movie for somebody to come back to us and we're still at the same place we were spiritually and so I want us to all consider our spiritual health our spiritual growth for today are we on this path of spiritual maturity now we know that we're supposed to be but this morning I want to talk to you about some of the benefits of that Because I don't think we often think about other than, well, we have to read our Bible, we have to pray, we have to go to church, all these things. We don't think about why we do a lot of the things that we do. And so this morning, I want to show you from this passage some of the benefits of spiritual maturity that we can find as we're growing in Christ. Look back at verse 12 for just a moment. He says, although by this time you ought to be teachers... You need someone to teach you. Look at how he calls what he calls God's word or the the message about Jesus here. The basic principles of God's revelation. He says the basic principles of God's revelation. In other words, you need somebody to teach you the knowledge of God. 
to know more about God. And I think this is one of the huge benefits of spiritual maturity is that you can correctly gain knowledge of God. When you're growing spiritually, you can correctly gain knowledge of God. And how do we do that? Well, we grow from regular time in God's Word. We grow from spending time with other believers. As I uh, mentioned in my prayer this morning, one of the things that we do, like when we sing even, is we're saying things that remind us about truths of God's Word and reminds us about what God's Word says. We learn from one another. And with this time spent together, we can grow in our knowledge of God. We grow in our knowledge of God in prayer. But now, before we get any farther, let me just also add to this. And this is important, and some, maybe somebody this morning needs to hear this. Our relationship with God has to be and, and must be more than just knowledge about God. Because there are plenty of people who have knowledge about God who are headed straight for hell. And you may say, well, pastor, how do you know that? Satan has knowledge about God. Even Satan knows about God. And so we can have knowledge about God and still be headed straight for hell. There's a difference between knowing about God and actually knowing God. Our knowledge of God should lead us to have a relationship with God, should lead us to a deeper relationship with God. And so this morning, maybe you've been, as you're thinking about this, maybe you've been coming to Beacon Hill for years. Maybe you just started, and you would say, the sum of my Christian experience is really just knowledge about God, like almost like an academic thing. Listen, God came for you to, to know much more than that. He came for you to know him. Jesus came into the world so you can have a relationship with God, so you can know God yourself and be able to call him your father. He's your, and, and as he's your father, you're his child. But the only way we can truly know God in this way, the Bible says, is if we repent and place our faith and trust in Jesus alone. We have to realize that we've all sinned. We've all fallen short in front of a holy God that we sing about. And we can't stand before that holy God because of our sin. But yet Jesus, being fully God and fully man, came and never sinned. And he died on the cross to pay the punishment, the fine for your sin and my sin. And the Bible says after Jesus died, three days later, he came back to life. And now because of his death and resurrection, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You can know Jesus today, but you have to say, God, I'm sorry for my sin. Please forgive me. And I put my faith and trust in Jesus alone for salvation, and I want to be saved. And that is really when you begin walking on this journey of knowing God. But as we know God in this way, we grow in our relationship to him as we learn more about him. As we spend that time in his word, as we spend that time in prayer, we grow in our knowledge of God. And if you think about it for just a moment, if you don't know the Bible, then you won't have accurate, correct knowledge of God. If you don't know the Bible, you won't have great knowledge of God and I think this is one of Satan's tricks that he does on us especially if we've been in church a long time he tells us oh we don't really need the Bible and he doesn't say it in those ways we oftentimes don't think about it in those ways what it is that we often think about is like well we already know this stuff you know we we've read that story of Noah since you know we were little kids We've heard the story of Jesus on the cross and his resurrection a million times. I could quote that in my sleep. And so we get to a point that we think we've almost gone beyond needing this. I remember a point in my life where I was getting ready to go into Bible college for the first time. And um, as many of you know, I had grown up as a pastor's kid. My dad went into ministry when I was three years old. And I was at church pretty much every time the doors were open. Outside of that, we had devotion times at home pretty much every night. And so when I went to Bible college, I thought, oh, this is going to be a breeze. <laughs> I thought, if anybody knows the Bible, it's me. Maybe my professor, I, didn't, I don't think I actually thought this, but my attitude was like, maybe my professors could like learn a thing or two for me, you know, like. Uh, and so what happened was when you enrolled, I went to Clear Creek Baptist Bible College for my first 
uh, years in college. And when you enrolled at Clear Creek, one of the first things they do is give you an entrance exam, just a Bible knowledge exam where, you know, they ask a bunch of questions. I thought, oh, I'm going to ace this. And I, as I thought about it, I thought they're probably doing this so they can kind of like differentiate, you know, who really knows the Bible and kind of who is just starting out. I think I got a 60 on the, on the test. And I realized the reason that they gave this test wasn't to distinguish who knew and who didn't. The reason they gave it was to humble those who had an attitude like I did. I mean, I was quickly humbled, and I realized, listen, the more that I know about the Bible and learn about the Bible, the more I realize there is so much more that I don't know. There is so much more that I need to learn in and grow in. We never graduate from learning about God. And I think sometimes we get in this mentality, especially growing up in the church, like, well, just like uh, in school, we start out at preschool or kindergarten, we go through 12th grade, we graduate, and then we might go to college, we might not, but at that point, we're educated, right? And we think maybe if our kids go to children's ministry or youth ministry, if we do all of that, like when we get to college and on, like we know the Bible. But listen, we never graduate from learning about God. There is so much more to God than we could ever, ever grasp hold of. We have to learn and follow after, after him. And until we're with the Lord and see him face to face, we won't come to the point that we have enough knowledge of him. And let me just add on, what a privilege it is that we get to know about him. I mean, the fact that God would reveal himself to us through his word and most fully through his son who came to walk among us, what a privilege it is that we could even know about God. Knowing about God helps us to be closer to him in relationship. It helps us to more correctly worship him because we know who we're worshiping. It helps us to know if we're becoming more Christ-like in our actions and in our attitudes. And so this morning, as you think about your knowledge of God, I want you to stop for a second and assess what you know about God. Just be honest with yourself. Think about what you know about God and imagine if you were talking to someone who didn't know about God and they started formulating in their mind what God was like after a conversation with you or after observing your actions, what kind of picture of God would they get? It reminds me, uh, many of you have probably seen uh, these criminal sketch artist renderings of criminals. Uh, most of the time when this happens, it's because after a crime's been committed, they don't have a good like uh, surveillance footage of the criminal or, or pictures or really know who it is. So what they'll do is they, they'll call in the witnesses and they'll ask them to describe what the criminal looked like. And they'll have these artists who sketch these drawings based on the description. And so they'll be drawing them out, and I don't know if you've ever seen these, but sometimes they're decent, oftentimes they're not. Well, studies, recent studies have shown that in these artist renderings of these criminals, that only about 8% are even remotely accurate. And the reason is, is because they're depending upon the witnesses to give the description, and oftentimes the witnesses' descriptions are flawed in some ways because they don't accurately know or remember who they're trying to describe and it made me think about if somebody had a description of God from our actions or even our words would they have an accurate description of God you see we are to be growing and maturing in our knowledge of God so much so that we could tell people if they asked us what's God like that we could just tell them exactly what the Bible says what God is like and isn't it amazing that we can know that even and so we have to be maturing in our knowledge of God. We have to be growing in what we know about him. It has to be a high priority. But another benefit that we see here is not just that you can correctly have this knowledge of God. Another benefit we see from this passage is in verse 14, and that is you can correctly discern right from wrong. Look at verse 14. He says, but solid food is for who? Who does it say? The mature. You see that there? Solid food is for the mature. For those, and this describes those who are mature, those whose senses 
have been trained to distinguish between good and evil. Those whose senses have been trained to distinguish between good and evil. So in other words, as you're growing in the faith, your senses, if you will, are sharpened to the point that you get to the point that you can know right from wrong. Like a sense, almost. Now, I had a couple of buddies in Scottsville who were part of uh, different police departments, different police organizations, and one in particular was given a uh, puppy who was being trained to be a police dog. And these police dogs, these canines, they are absolutely incredible uh, at what they do. But this puppy, as he was given this puppy, it didn't know all of these things. It had to go through these trainings. And as it went through the trainings and grew in this, the dog got to the point that he was able to sniff out drugs like it was just a sixth sense. And these dogs can be trained in a lot of different things, not just sniffing out nar- uh, drugs and like narcotics and things like that, marijuana, different things, but even to the point that you have like bomb sniffing dogs and dogs that can uh, sniff out like cell phones even and track people. Like these are unbelievable skills, but they were not born with these skills. These skills were honed and developed, and as they grew in them, they got to the point that it was like just another sense that they had. And the Bible says that as we grow and mature in Christ, we can get to the point that we have this sense of knowing right from wrong. That's what Romans 12 verse 2 talks about. It says, don't be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. So the more you follow God, the more your mind changes to be like his. The more you mature, the more your mind changes to be like his. And then you can discern exactly what his will is. Why? Because you have a sense of right and wrong. You have grown in that. And you might be saying, well, pastor, how can this be a benefit? Well, studies show that people in general make about 35,000 different decisions per day. Think about this, 35,000 different decisions per day. That number translates to about 2,000 decisions per hour. That number goes on down to be about one decision every two seconds. We're making decisions. Now, certainly these aren't like life-altering decisions we're making every two seconds. These are almost like subconscious decisions, things that we do without even thinking about it. But consider how important it is to have a sense of right from wrong when your decision-making is at the subconscious level. Like you're making decisions without even thinking about it. How important is it that you know right from wrong when you're making those decisions? Extremely important. But even if we only talked about the major decisions we made or or the conscious decisions that we make, if you're having a discussion with people at work, and let's say they try to invite you into some kind of juicy gossip that's going on, most of the time you're not going to be like, let's pause this conversation. I'm going to go over here and look up verses about gossip real quick. Like, I've got to think about what I need to do here, so let me go look up these verses. It's not how it works, right? Most of the time we make decisions on the fly. When a group of people are trying to invite you in to do something sinful, you're not like, well, hang on. Uh, Can I come back to this in like a week? Let me pray about it, do some Bible study, and then I'll get back to you. It's not how it works. How it works is we make decisions almost instantly without our Bibles right in front of us. And so we have to be able to discern right from wrong. And that's one of the great benefits of spiritual maturity. And so if you had to think about your discernment right now, discerning right from wrong, how sharp would you be? Could people depend upon your advice or your opinion for making a good, godly decision? Could people come to you and ask, hey, what should we do in this situation or what should I do in this situation? Because there are people all around who need us to do this. Maybe our spouses. Certainly our kids, our grandkids. If, they are, if our kids or grandkids came to us and said, Mom, Dad, Grandma, Grandpa, I'm having this going on at school. 
what, what do you think I should do? You know, this, this other kid's being mean to me. What do you think I should do? Are you going to have a good, godly answer for them? We have to be able to know about God, but we also need the spiritual maturity to know right from wrong and lead ourselves and lead other people. If another church member came up to you and said, well, what do you think I should do in this situation that I'm going through in my family? Can your fellow church members, your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ depend upon you for that advice? You see, this comes back to that whole we before me. And that gets me to this next thing I want to talk about. Look back at verse 12. This is a third benefit, and this is huge in our church. He says, although by this time you ought to be teachers, he says you need someone to teach you. So the goal in spiritual maturity is that we get to the point that we're teaching people. Now, we talked about this with Matthew 28 just a couple of weeks ago. The goal of discipleship is that we tell everyone about Jesus, that we baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and what? Teach them to observe everything that Jesus has commanded us. The goal of discipleship is to teach people so they can teach people. And we talked about how that might be in a formal situation, but ultimately it's oftentimes very informal. And so I want you to realize through the teaching and also through discernment that your spiritual maturity, and I want you to hear me clearly this morning, your spiritual maturity affects way more people than just you. Now let that sink in for just a moment. Your spiritual maturity affects way more people than just you. It affects your spouse. It affects your children, your grandchildren, your family, your co-workers, friends. It affects your church. You might say, well, how does it affect anybody else but me? Because your spiritual maturity comes out in your words, comes out in your actions. How spiritually mature you are and what you think about right and wrong and God comes out in your attitude your decisions that you make, your opinions that you may give, like in grow group or something like that, ultimately your spiritual maturity affects those around you. And every bit of this is dependent on where you are in your relationship with the Lord. I'm reminded of this quote that says, you can't lead anyone else further than you've gone yourself. I saw this firsthand with my oldest son, Jack. He was playing baseball. I played baseball like through Little League, like till I was 12. And as I was coaching him, I realized there came a point that he got to the place that he knew more than I did about baseball. Like he was getting into that area. And I was coaching him. And it was at that point that I decided, okay, I have to step back and let some other people coach him now because I can't take him further than I've been myself. And the same is true spiritually. You can't take your spouse, you can't take your kids, your grandkids, your co-workers, fellow church members, you can't take them any farther in their relationship with the Lord than you are yourself. And that's where it comes back to we before me. Spiritual maturity, spiritual growth is a personal thing, but it's also something that affects the whole kingdom of God. Every one of us have to be striving towards spiritual maturity. And as I said, we've got a lot of ways to do that here at Beacon Hill, certainly through personal Bible study and prayer, and we try to promote prayer in our church, but through our growth groups, our Wednesday night studies, all of this is to help you grow. And why do we do this? It's because we need this, right? We need each other. That's why we do this. And I want you to look back for just a moment as the passage at the passage as the writer is writing them what is his biggest issue with them think about this for just a moment what is his biggest issue with their lack of growth what did he say is the problem the source of the reason why they're not growing look at verse 11 he says we have a great deal to say about this and it's difficult to explain why since you have become too lazy to understand 
too lazy to understand. Let me remind you, this was written 2,000 years ago, before the Christians had access to freedom to worship, before they had access to the full revelation of God in the Bible, before they had access to books and podcasts and all of these different opportunities that we have today. This was before that. And what does he say? You all are, are too lazy. You're being too lazy. And I think the main source of our lack of spiritual growth in America today is for the very same reason. If we're not growing spiritually, often it's because we're being lazy. We say things like, well, I don't have enough time. I, I just don't like to read. Or maybe I don't understand what I'm reading. And we have all these ways to help with all of these things. We just, we might say, well, you know, that that's my time with family, or I don't want to give that up or do that thing. And here's the, the bottom line. Assess your spiritual growth today is the reason you're not where you need to be in your advancement of spiritual maturity because you've been lazy. It's a hard thing to hear. It's a hard thing to think about, even for myself. Because for every single one of us, we know that we need to do more in growing. But let me remind you that as we grow, that our spiritual growth affects way more than just us. And so this morning, in just a moment, we're going to have a time of commitment. And here's what I want us to think about this morning. First of all, if you don't know Jesus, maybe your relationship with God is non-existent. Maybe you just know some things about God and you want to come and have a relationship with God. I would love to talk to you about that. In just a minute, we're going to sing. People are going to be coming forward. We're going to be making some decisions. If your decision is I need to be saved, if your decision is I need to be baptized or something else, I want you to come forward. I would love to talk to you about that. But maybe this morning, as you're thinking about your relationship with God, if you're honest with yourself, and if you're honest with God because he knows it, you would say, I've been kind of a lazy Christian. I've been a lazy Christian. And I'm not growing and developing like I should be. And so this morning, I want to come and ask God to forgive me and ask him to help me grow. Not only for your sake, but for your, for your family's sake, for your church family's sake. Maybe for you this morning, as you look at your life, you say, well, I have been growing like I need to, but I want to come and just thank God that I can know him. I want to come and just ask God to help our church continue to grow how we need to be. Listen, when we talk about church growth, yeah, we want to see numbers grow, but we want to see a spiritually healthy church. And it starts with this commitment to spiritual maturity. Let's bow our heads together. As you're reflecting on how God is moving in your heart this morning, I want to say a prayer that as you think about this, that you would make the decisions that you need to make. And as you're reflecting on this, I want you to consider these things. If we can't correctly teach one another about God, then what happens? If we can't correctly discern right from wrong as a church or as a family or as individuals, then what happens? If we don't have a correct knowledge of God as a church or as individuals, what happens? We get to a place that, frankly, we do not want to be as a church or as a people of God. And so this morning, as you're reflecting, I'm going to pray for you that you would make the commitments that God is placing on your heart, that if he's leading you to come and pray, that you would do that, but that we leave here fully committed to do what God wants us to do. Father, we've seen from your word today that it's vital that we grow in our relationships with you. And Lord, we know that oftentimes, quite frankly, we get lazy. And Lord, you're there waiting to speak to us. You're there waiting to reveal your will to us. And it's because of our laziness that we just don't understand it. Lord, help us to commit today to be a church of mature believers. And God, we know that we can't do that overnight, but it's a process. And so, Lord, this morning, help us to commit to that process. Help us to commit to not be lazy Christians, but to put in the time 
to grow. Lord, we thank you for working through your spirit. Convict us now. Move us to a place that we need to be with you. Help us to make those confessions, those commitments today. In Jesus' name, amen.